Um, in the last lecture, we looked at the water model on a general graph, uh, and we uh, looked at how to calculate the probability that all agents uh, reach consensus on a particular value from a finite set of possible values. Uh, and this time we are going to look at how long it takes to reach consensus, assuming that it is reached. Uh, so let me share screen. Uh, okay, so we are going to look at the time to reach consensus. Uh, I'm going to begin by describing a general approach to uh, calculating or to bounding this uh, random time. Uh, while the approach works for a general graph in principle, in practice, you can only uh, do the calculations if there's a lot of symmetry in the graph. So we will restrict the actual calculation to the complete graph, but uh, I'll describe the method in full generality because in principle it can be described uh, in full generality. Uh, okay, so uh, what's the problem we are interested in? So we are uh, looking at the water model on a general graph that we introduced last time. And let me quickly remind you of that. So you have uh, m agents which are sitting on the vertices of a graph g um, for every pair of vertices v and w for every ordered pair uh, contacts uh, v contacts w at the jump times of a poisson process of intensity q v w uh, if there's no edge between them q v w is zero so there are no contacts uh, if there is an edge, QVW is assumed to be strictly positive, and that's the rate at which V contacts W. Uh, every agent or vertex has opinions from a finite set, and for uh, simplicity, we assume the set consists of just two elements, zero and one. Uh, the analysis can e easily be extended to larger finite sets. Um, uh, but anyway, so we consider the case of two opinions. Uh, and then if this graph is uh, strongly connected, meaning that there's a directed path between any two vertices, uh, then that means that any vertex can influence any other vertex. And it turns out that consensus is guaranteed on the graph. So eventually every agent reaches uh, a uh, has open, the same opinion. Uh, it could be zero, it could be one, but it's the same for all agents. Uh, and last time we looked at the probability that all agents agree on the opinion one as a function of the initial condition. And to do so, we introduced a martingale, we used optional stopping theorem, etc. cetera. Uh, this time, uh, we are going to look at the time it takes, the random time it takes to reach consensus. So we denote by capital T this random time. It's the smallest time at which either all agents have opinion one or all uh, opinion one or all agents have opinion zero. Okay. So this time is random and we want to, let's say, compute its uh, mean. Uh, and we can do that exactly for the complete graph, uh, but in general, we can only get uh, upper bounds on this random time. Uh, and so we are going to now describe this upper bounding technique uh, and then uh, calculate the upper bound on the complete graph. Uh, and, it, and this technique is very interesting. It uses a, uh, what's called a dual process. Uh, it looks at the water model backwards in time. And if you look at it backwards in time, uh, it becomes uh, a system of random walks, merging or coalescing random walks. And we'll introduce this process and study it in order to find the uh, upper bound on the time to reach consensus. Okay, so let's start with the water model. We are now going to consider uh, 
a complete graph on five nodes. Uh, so time starts here on top. This is time zero and time is running down the page from top to bottom. Okay, so uh, we'll call this vertex one, two, three, four, five. For each vertex, we've drawn its timeline uh, and we've also marked the initial opinion. So vertex one uh, starts with opinion zero. Vertices two and three start with two, three and five start with opinion one and four has opinion zero to start with as well. And as time proceeds, the vertices contact each other at random times and those are marked by directed arrows. So as time proceeds, the first thing that happens is that vertex two contacts vertex five and that's a directed arrow from two to five. And recall that we had the pull model for the dynamics. That means that when two calls five, two copies the opinion of five. So the opinion of five was the same as its original opinion. So nothing changes at that this time. Then a bit later on, vertex one calls vertex three and copies its opinion. So at this time, vertex one will change its opinion from zero to one. Okay, and similarly here, vertex four calls two, so it changes its opinion from zero to one and so on. In fact, here consensus has already been reached at this time, but we run the model up to some uh, arbitrary time and look at what happens at the end of that time. So we want to know what the opinions are at this, uh, at this final time, okay? And so we could work out the opinions at this final time by following the evolution forwards in time from here and seeing what happens at each of these arrows. Instead, what we are going to do is look at things backwards in time starting from here. So we'll start from this given terminal time, uh, look at what happens backwards in time and then ask based on that, has consensus been reached or not? And the way we are going to do this is the following. So what we are going to do is put a particle at each vertex at the bottom of the timeline here. So this is the final time and there's a particle at each vertex and we are going to go look backwards in time. So we are going to go up the page uh, towards the time origin. And then the first thing we see here is that vertex three uh, contacts vertex four and copies its opinion. So if we want to know what the opinion of vertex three was at the end of this time period, then what happened to vertex three before this time is irrelevant because it's copying four what matters to its final opinion was what happened to four before this time, but what happened to anything that happened to three before this time uh, does not directly, that influence does not propagate directly to the final time, okay? Is that clear? So we don't, really care about what happened to vertex three on this stretch of the timeline. Uh, and so we are going to mark that by saying the particle from three moves to four here. So we need to keep track of what happens to vertex four. And by doing so, we will also know what happened to vertex three. And so we'll, at this point in time, going backwards, we will move the particle from three to four and merge it with this particle here because the fates of three and four are tied at the final time are tied together. Uh, they are tied together by what happened to four before this previous time. Okay, so we mark that by okay, putting a red light here saying that influence doesn't propagate past this red light along the direct timeline. 
uh, and moving the particle. So we, we are killing the particle at three, or if you like, moving it to four, merging it with four, and backwards in time, there's no particle here at three anymore. Okay, but we have to keep track of what happens to vertices one, two, four, and five. Moving a bit further back in time, five contacts one, so five is going to copy one, and therefore what happened to vertex five before this time is irrelevant. It has no influence on the final state of five. The final state of five is determined by what happened to vertex one before this time. Agreed? Good, so similarly, we get rid of the particle at five, we move it to one, merge it with the particle at one, and say that these two particles now have their fates tied together, and there's, uh, and that there's no particle at five. So we've put a red light here to say no influence propagates. The particle at five has moved to one and merged with the particle at one, but we still have to keep track of what's happening at two and four. Again, if you need to pause and think about this construction a bit more. Okay, and we keep proceeding backwards in time. And what happens next backwards in time? Uh, the next thing to happen is that three calls five. Uh, and so at this time, three copies the opinion of five, but we don't care. We don't care what happened to node three before this. Uh, and that's represented by there being no blue particle here. Uh, so even though three contacted five here, nothing happens, nothing of interest happens. Because we don't care about the opinion of three at this point in time. So we continue moving backwards in time. One calls two and copies the opinion of two. So the particle from one is going to move to two and merge with this particle. And we don't care what happened to one before this time. So we'll put a red light here to signify that. Oh, okay, so I progressed this to say nothing happened at the time of this arrow. Nothing of interest happened due to this arrow and then uh, the effect of this arrow was to put a red light here, move the blue particle here to merge with this one. And now the only particles left are at vertices uh, two and four. And then the next thing happens is that four contacts two. So what happens to four before this time is irrelevant. It's going to copy the opinion of two. So I get rid of, I move this particle from four to two, merge it with two and put a red light here to say influence doesn't propagate past this red light. Okay, so there's my particle at two. So, and now there's just a single particle left. And this is saying that the opinion of everybody at the final terminal time is determined by the opinion of vertex two at this time, uh, at this time. And to find out what that is, we have to go all the way backwards to the time origin. So we continue proceeding backwards. So what happens here? Here vertex one contacts vertex three, but there's no particle at vertex one. So we don't care. We don't care that, uh, one copy three at this point of time because uh, that's not going to influence uh, one's final opinion. Um, or even how one influences anyone else later. Okay, so uh, nothing happened at this time. We've just cop copied this particle over here, so it's just moved backwards in time. Uh, and now uh, two copies five. So that means 
uh, what happened to vertex two before this time is irrelevant. We have to put a red light here to say influence doesn't propagate. So what happens to this particle? It should go to five and it should merge with the particle at five, but there is no particle at five to merge with. So it just goes there. It becomes the only particle there. Okay, so two moves to five. It doesn't merge because there's nothing to merge with. So it's just a move without a merge. And then we put a red light here. Okay, so in the, we put a red light here and two has moved to five. And now this is the only particle left and we get to the origin of time. So what this says in this backwards in time construction is that all nodes at the end of this time period uh, acquired their opinions from that of five at the beginning of this time period. Okay. And the opinion of five at the beginning of this time period was one. So everybody's final opinion is one. You can look at this diagram and try to uh, uh, simulate it forwards in time and you should get the same answer that everybody has reached consensus on one. Okay. And the backwards in time picture says the same thing. Everybody has taken uh, has copied the opinion of vertex five, which at the start of the time period was one. So everybody's final opinion is one and consensus has been reached. That's the picture. Okay, so what does this backwards in time construction do for us? Uh, it, uh, if you do this backwards in time construction and you end up with a single particle, then it says that consensus is guaranteed at the end of the time period you were looking at. So you have to fix a time horizon, little t, let's say, and you want to ask the question, has consensus been reached by time, little t? And the way you answer this question is look backwards in time at this uh, uh, picture. Uh, and see if you're in, left with just a single particle. And if you're left with just, just a single particle, that means everybody got their opinions from a single vertex initially. So they must all have the same opinion at this final time t, and therefore consensus is reached. Okay, and in this uh, particular example, that's what happened. We were left with a single particle. But if there were a different set of arrows, these are all random after all, uh, when these arrows uh, happen. Uh, so these arrows correspond to some vertex calling some other vertex, and these are put down at random according to Poisson processes of the different rates for contacts. So this picture here is random, and depending on the specific realization you get you might, when you run this backwards, you might have a single particle, you might have uh, two particles or any number of particles. Okay, what if you had two particles at the end? Uh, then have you reached consensus at the final time? Well, that, that depends on where those particles are. If you had two particles at vertices three and five, then that means everybody got their final opinion from either three or from five. And in this case, their initial opinions are the same. So indeed consensus would have been achieved. But if your two particles sat at vertices five and one, uh, then their initial opinions are different. Uh, and so consensus has not been reached. Uh, so consensus is not guaranteed if there's more than one particle left in the backwards in time process. But if there's exactly one particle left, then consensus is guaranteed. And also note that you, you will be, you can't be left with zero particles. Particles are not killed, they move and they, uh, if the vertex they move to is occupied, then they merge with the particle there. So the merge can reduce the number of particles by one, uh, but uh, it can never kill a particle, uh, uh, bring it down to zero, because you can't, uh, if you move to an unoccupied site, you don't die. So you can never 
get to zero particles. So there's uh, either one or more particles when you finish the backwards in time process. If there's one, consensus is guaranteed. If there's more than one, then consensus depends on the initial condition. So we get an upper bound on the time to consensus by looking at whether, looking at how long you have to go in order to ensure that there's exactly one particle left. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's uh, finish discussing this picture. So this was, uh, so if you want to know the times at which things move backwards, and how influence propagated. So, uh, so how do you find out from, okay, if you had more than one particle left, then how do you find out what the final opinions were? Uh, you follow the, okay, uh, in this picture, there's only one particle. So you know what the final opinion of all the vertices is, but if you had more than one particle, say there was one at vertex five and another at vertex one, and these have different opinions, so you want to know uh, which vertices got, had their final opinion derived from one and which ones derived from five, uh, then you have to uh, then can you again read it off this picture and you can. Uh, so to see how influence propagates, it propagates down these timelines, but it can't go past a red light. Okay, so it goes down here, but it can't progress past this. But it can also go along arrows in the opposite direction to the arrow. So here, uh, two copied five, and that's saying influence from five uh, moved uh, to two and continues down this timeline. So if you're thinking of, uh, um, okay, okay, let's just say that a particle can walk uh, down these timelines and can walk along arrows in the opposite direction. And then let's look at, uh, so you want to find uh, where, uh, or maybe it's clearer backwards in time. So you can't go past a red light, but you can go backwards along this black line and you can follow the arrows in the direction. So how does, uh, uh, so how is, what's the final opinion of vertex two? You follow this black arrow backwards, follow this line, and you see that it's the opinion of five initially, which is one. What about vertex, okay, four? You keep going backwards, you can't go past this red light, but you go here, then you continue going up, you can't go past that, but you go up the, through, through this arrow and then you reach here, etc. Uh, okay, so that's how uh, you determine the final states of different nodes. And uh, in this picture, we've done that. So we've said that uh, say three goes up to here, switches to here, goes up there, passes here, uh, goes up there, passes here and so on, okay. So that's the picture. Uh, and now, how do we use this picture to find out whether by time uh, little t, uh, so we fix a value little t, it's not a run, random, uh, and then we ask the question, has consensus been reached by this time little t? Uh, and to do this, we want to ask if running the process backwards from little t, you're left with just a single particle by time zero, or if you're left with more than one particle. So let me 
again, uh, re-describe this process of coalescing random walks uh, a bit more carefully. So we start with one particle at each vertex. And then how do these particles move? Uh, they uh, distinct particles move independently of each other. Now, backwards in time, uh, okay, so when does a particle move? So if we follow an arrow backwards in time, uh, it moves, this particle here moves when there's an arrow from this timeline to some other timeline. So these arrows correspond uh, to times at which, so this timeline corresponds to vertex four. So arrows directed out of this timeline correspond to when vertex four talks to some other vertex. Okay, so here there was just this one time, it talked to some other vertex. For vertex three, there were two times. It talked to vertex four here, it talked to vertex five here. So these arrows correspond to times at which a vertex talks to some other vertex. And uh, any such arrow is something a particle will follow. So the particle does a random walk moving along arrows whenever it sees them. And when does it see them? Uh, it sees an arrow from vertex V to vertex W at the jump times of a Poisson process of intensity QVW. That's how we uh, uh, describe the water model, right? So in the water model, each vertex V talks to a vertex W according to a Poisson process of intensity v, w, QVW. And whenever it talks to vertex W, it copies the uh, opinion of vertex W. Uh, and that means the particle at V moves to W, and if there's a particle at W, it merges with that particle. Uh, so particles perform independent random walks, uh, and they, uh, the rate of moving from V to W is given by the VW element of this rate matrix Q. So it's given by QVW. Uh, one slight subtlety, so QVW, these Poisson processes of intensity QVW uh, uh, correspond to the model forwards in time. For the forward time model, they describe when somebody talks to somebody else. Uh, the random walk is for the backwards in time model. So in saying that they move according to the same rules, we are making use of the fact that if you look at a Poisson process backwards in time, it looks exactly the same. Uh, this is a fact. Uh, this is the first time you're seeing the fact, but it's maybe not uh, uh, that hard to see. Uh, you, you can take it for granted if you like, think back to the definition of the Poisson process and convince yourself that that is true. I leave you to do that. Uh, but let's just take it for a fact that a Poisson process run backwards in time is exactly the same. It's a Poisson process of the same intensity. So uh, these particles which move according to the backwards in time water model move according to the same rate matrix Q. Okay, so now uh, there's a particle at V, uh, the Poisson clock on the edge VW ticks, so the particle moves from V to W. If there's already a particle at W, then these two particles merge, they become a single particle. And that single particle will continue to move just like before, it'll behave like any other particle. If uh, at this time, uh, if W was unoccupied, then there's no merger, the particle from V moves to W and occupies that site. <coughs> and if there was no particle at V when this Poisson clock rang, then nothing happens. Okay, so the particles do independent random walks as described, but independent until they meet some other particle. As soon as they meet another particle, 
they become one particle which moves us before. They, they lose their individual identities. Okay. And so we are interested if this in this backwards in time process, there's just a single particle left at time zero. Okay, so let's denote by yt the number of particles in the system at time t. Uh, so maybe I confuse things a bit there. So the coalescing random walks process is running forwards in time, but you should think of it as the same as the water model backwards in time. So we want to ask the question whether the water model has reached consensus by time little t. Uh, and that is the same as asking whether a coalescing random walk started with a single particle at time zero and running in forward time. Uh, sorry, a coalescing random walk mo model started with a particle at each vertex at time zero ends up with a single particle at some vertex by time little t. Uh, or if you let uh, capital T denote the random time to consensus in the water model, then what's the probability that <coughs> consensus has not yet been reached by time little t? It's the same as, it's not the same, it's bounded by the probability that uh, in the coalescing random walk model, there are two or more particles left. If there are two or more particles left, you may still have reached consensus because these two particles correspond to sites with the same initial opinion. Uh, but if, um, uh, but you're guaranteed consensus if there's just one particle left. Okay, so the random time to consensus, uh, so you have uh, definitely reach consensus if there's just one particle left. If there are two or more particles left, you may or may not have reached consensus. So the probability that you have not reached consensus is bounded by the probability of this event. And you can say the same thing in terms of stochastic domination, but we didn't define stochastic domination, so just ignore this. Okay, so we have an upper bound on the probability of consensus being reached by some time. And the expected time to consensus is just the integral of this probability. Or, um, okay, so the expected time, we can bound the expected time to consensus by calculating the expected time until there's just a single particle left in the coalescing random box model. And that's what we are going to do next. Okay, and this we can this calculation can only be done uh, explicitly on the complete graph, though the principle is the same for arbitrary graphs. Uh, so very quickly, the model we are going to look at is the following. G is the complete graph on n nodes, which we denote k sub n. And we are going to look at the fully symmetric setting, which is the, again, the only one where we can easily do calculations. So the rate at which vertex V contacts vertex W is going to be one over N, N minus one. Uh, this is what you get if you uh, start with the, uh, uh, if you start with the node centric model, put a unit rate clock on every node and say that when a node becomes active, it chooses uniformly at random, which are the vertex it's going to talk to. And it doesn't talk to itself. Okay, so uh, these rates correspond to that model. Now, what we'll do uh, in this case, it. Uh, in looking at this coalescing random walk model, because of the symmetry, it doesn't matter where exactly the particles are sitting. It's enough to keep track of the number of particles, okay? Because uh, the future evolution looks the same no matter where the particles are located. In terms of number of particles, it's the same. Uh, so, the, or to put it another way, the number of particles evolves as a Markov process. 
in on a general graph that's not true you have to keep track of where the particles are but on the complete graph with symmetric rates that is true so let's define tau sub k to be the first time that there are exactly k particles left uh, so um, at time zero, there's a particle at every vertex. So tau sub n is zero. Unlike the rumor spreading model where uh, as time progressed, you went from k to k plus one to k plus two and so on. Here you start at n with n particles and you're decreasing. You're going n minus one, n minus two and so on. And you want to know when you end up with just one particle. So uh, tau one is the time when you end up with just one particle. And this has uh, the same distribution as, uh, okay, as the upper bound on the time to consensus. Um, okay, so that's what we want to calculate, the expectation of tau one. So now if there are k particles, how long does it take until some two of these particles merge and we are left with only k minus one particles? There's a particle at each vertex. Now, if a particle at vertex, okay, now if there's a particle at vertex v and v talks to w, then the particle at vertex v moves to vertex w. Uh, if W is unoccupied, that's just a move. Nothing else happens. There's no merger. So in that case, the number of particles doesn't decrease. The only way the number of particles can decrease is when, is if W is also occupied at the time that this move happened. So we need to look at all pairs of occupied vertices and look at the rates at which communications happen between them, because it's only when a particle moves from an occupied site to an occupied site that there's a merger. Okay, so if there are K particles, uh, how many edges are there between occupied sites? There are K choose two pairs of occupied sites, but a move in either direction, particle at V moving to W or particle at W moving to V leads to a merger. So there are two possible directions for each edge or to put it another way, there, there's a total of K times K minus one directed edges between pairs of occupied sites. And so a particle moving along any one of these directed edges will coalesce with another particle. And the times between moves, the moves happen at the times of independent Poisson processes of rate one over n minus one. Uh, so the times between moves are exponential. It's the minimum of this many independent exponentials. So the rate of or the parameter of this exponential is the minimum corresponds to the sum. So you're adding one over n minus one this many times. And so the time until the number of particles decreases by one is exponentially distributed with this parameter independent of the past. Okay. And so the mean, as before, we know how the mean of an exponential is the reciprocal of its parameter. So the mean of this is n minus one divided by that. And if you expand in partial fractions, you get this. And then we do exactly the same thing as in the rumor spreading model. We are interested in the random time tau one. We write it as a telescoping sum and we add up the terms in the tele the means using linearity of expectation. And if you do the calculations, uh, you find that the mean time to reach consensus is n minus one, okay? Uh, or the bound, the mean time to end up with one particle in the coalescing random walk model is n minus one. And we uh, argued that that's an upper bound on the time to reach consensus. So the mean time to reach consensus is bounded by n minus one.
Okay, so that was the main result of this lecture and I'm going to stop here. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, this lecture relied on uh, describing the voter model backwards in time as a system of coalescing random walks. Uh, and this, uh, uh, this, this is a very ingenious construction and uh, this is maybe the most beautiful idea you're going to see in this course. So do make sure you understand it. Uh, I'll make a few uh, small remarks later on about the water model for, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but this is the substance uh, of, of how you calculate the, uh, the time to reach consensus or bound the time to reach consensus in this model. So I'm going to uh, stop the recording here.